Welcome, everybody, to the show. This is Counter Glibbing Show number 169 for April, what is it, the 15th, 2024. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, I guess I'll remind everybody to uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel. There's ways to support the channel in the video description and all that. I did not have, I, I do have pictures of the storm damage, but I will ask folks instead to go look at the short that I put up a couple days ago. Uh, that's from the storm damage that we had on Friday night. Nothing critical was da was was hurt. It's just a mess. So uh, once again, thanks everybody for coming. Tonight we're going to talk about building networks for war gamers. Uh, meeting meeting essentially how to find people to play war games with. Um, I felt like this would be an appropriate topic at this time, and we do have a small piece of. We're aiming news tonight as well. So once again, thanks everybody for coming out. We got 84 people here already. Uh, I think everything is in order. Let me put the ticker up, although I did not remember to update the ticker, so I apologize for that. But it is what it is at this point. We did get the taxes done. That was a big hassle. Let me put it that way. And it, 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 it I was going to get it done like Tuesday, and then I was going to get it done Wednesday, and then I was going to get it done on Friday, and it didn't get done until Saturday. But it's done, and it could have been worse, so I'm reasonably happy enough with it. Um, so let me pull up the stuff for the show, because I don't have the chat up on the screen right now. So hold on one second. There's a thing where you've got to pop, you've got to like in, be viewing the stream in YouTube studio and have the chat popped out at the time or it won't pick it up. So, um, ugh. oh, I would have there. Oh, man, this is actually a major stress point every year is just finding all the paperwork that we need. Um, so uh, and you could file an extension, but, you know, I, I, that's that's just kicking the can down the road as far as I'm concerned. So, um. So, by the way, if I have not mentioned this before, I want to give a shout out to Stigler, who passed uh, his uh, old set of The Wire to me, which I have to get to watching to, which means I need to uh, uh, do nothing except for put the disc in, because I've in the war room back here, we have a TV with a DVD player, or blue, whatever it is, Blu-ray player. It might be a play of Blu-rays, I don't know. So, thank you, Stigler, for sending me that. Um <laughs> Well, I do use H&R Block, and I did not notice this problem, but maybe that's because I did it on Saturday and not on, like, Monday morning, right? So, so that sucks. Um, but in any case, uh, my commiserations is anybody that had to deal with that American bullshit at this time. So, um, but anyway, let's, before we get any further here... Let's say hello to B. Atkins, Bayonet Brant from the Armchair Dragoons, Bill Simone, Board Gaming Geezer, Charles Latora, Christophe de Klerk. Thanks for coming by. Clark Commando 1983. Mark, thank you for coming as well. Dale Brady, Daniel Silverthorne, Ed Holtzman, Eric Goble, Eric's Table, Napoleonic Battles. Eric's Table has a fantastic Labatai channel. I passed on a pretty good price on three Labatai games that I saw come up for sale on the constant marketplace earlier today because I just don't have the money. Um, the legend himself, Fucko, is here. Jeff Anderson, Jeff Beeler, Joe Okabayashi, John Nolan, Jonathan Dyer, Ken Coleman, Joel Menders, Mark McNair, Beandering Mike, Michael Avanzini, Molotov, Cockatiel Games, Palmer Eldridge, Paul Sin, Paw Paw, Perfidious Albion, Perry Sparopoulos, Rob Johnson, Sean Torno, Stacking Limit is here. Stigler, of course, already mentioned. Tim Greenhaw, Tim Zales, Todd Cox, Vince Reeve, Vincenzo Beretta, William Aarons, William Bird, Winterson, and Wolf Dog. I apologize to anyone whom I ha may have missed, uh, but we're blaming YouTube as usual. So, and John C. from the sunny Philippines. John, thanks for coming by. I, I don't know that it was you that I followed on Blue Sky, but it looked like it might have been, so I followed you. So, let me know if it wasn't. In any case, um, we are not drinking tonight because I have a, some things that have to get done after the show, and they won't get done if I have a drink tonight, except for water. We are clipping, however, and I don't have it set up because it actually won't fit here. Um, we're between the states. This is the decision version, which has been reacquired. Um, it is a very credible uh, iteration of the SPI underappreciated classic in my opinion. Uh, not that it's a flawless game, it is not, but I think there's a lot to recommend it as well. Um, so, and we are pretty much finished with Jackson and Corinth. I'm done clipping it, I just have to organize it. 
Um, so I am paying, uh, I think this is up on Kickstarter already. Am I mistaken about that? So uh, let me touch on this briefly. I've got both versions. You can see the SPI version up here. And while the maps on the, the decision version are Joey House maps, they're much, much more attractive. Um, if anybody else is having video trouble, please pipe up in the chat. Um, uh, they, the decision maps lack the mysterious and fantastical large forest that is in the middle of Kansas in, uh, in the SPI version inexplicably. Um, other and the optional leader system is in there, and they give you counters for it. That's pretty much the reason to, to pick up the decision version, um, in my opinion, bar, barring availability issues. But I think it's a, we've, this is the one we've played. I thought it was fairly credible. Fucko was in on that game, and and uh, I I had it and got rid of it, and then thought harder about it and decided I need to reacquire it. So. Uh, I haven't gotten a shipping notification yet, but they did charge me for, I forget exactly what is on that charge, but it, one of the things was the, uh, for the people, uh, uh, new map and box. So, uh, yes, HON 644 new, new says that, uh, the Kickstarter for the third printing closed already. So keep your eyes closed, pe peeled on the flying pig games. If you want it all. Whenever I see this acronym, this is the most fearful sacrifice, Herman Lettman's magisterial uh, Gettysburg treatment. Uh, whenever I see the acronym, I always think of All Flesh Must Be Eaten, which is a zombie RPG that was fairly popular quite a long time ago now. Don't know if it is something that is still around or, uh, anymore or not. Um, anybody, I'll, I'll mention this too, and I've said this before, but just for anybody who wasn't uh, watching before, um, For the People is fantastic and is highly recommended by me. So if you are interested in the American, you know what? I wasn't interested in American Civil War war games until playing For the People, and that is the game that, that sold me on it. I'm uh, attempting a slightly different uh, organizational system this time around with this than last time. Um, I am doing all the union stuff, and then I will use that as the basis from which to organize the Confederate stuff. There are a couple of differences between the countermixes other than just numbers of pieces, uh, which you'd expect to have. But um, there are no Confederate siege trains, and there are no union partisans. There probably should be union partisans, um, because that is a thing that did happen in a couple of places, East Tennessee and in Missouri and... Uh, there was an, a, an enclave in Mississippi or Alabama or something like that, too. Um, so it probably should be in there. But then again, uh, the way partisans work is, I think, one of the problems in the game. I don't think they work particularly well. There is a video on the SPI version of uh, War Between the States in the cooker. I don't know when that's going to show up because I keep having these great ideas for things that I want to do video on. And Right now, time is it a, uh, uh, there's a lot of time constraints right now, as you can imagine. So a couple of things of business. Let me pull one of them up. Where is the thing? Okay. Obviously, I came in super prepared for tonight. All right. So first of all, there is a GoFundMe up for the benefit of, uh, of Dean Essig. Now, unfortunately, we have to say the late Dean Essig's grandchildren uh, to help them, you know, establish college funds and stuff like that. I'm going to throw the link to this in the chat. Um, if anyone would like to hop over there and, and donate or share it around, if you're not in a position to donate right now, um, this is, you know, one of the ways in which we can commemorate our Dean and our memories of Dean. I'm also going to mention that the Charles S. Roberts Award ballot is open. If you have not uh, voted yet, feel free to vote. I have put the link to that in the chat as well. And if you want to go look at all the stuff, you can go to charlessroberts.com, uh, charlessrobertsawards.com, um, and see all the nominees and stuff like that. But all that information is in the ballot as well. So um, so do check that out. I know I, I've said before, I don't like to, that's something I don't like to mention on the show because I don't want to like... People think I don't want I don't want to create the appearance of self promotion, but I also would like people to vote. And right now, the uh, the voting numbers are they feel really strong. Let me put it that way. We'll see what uh, what the final numbers look like in a couple of weeks when the voting closes. But 
Um, right now, the numbers look really strong. We, uh, we didn't have a perfect year as far as nominations are concerned. There's some things that uh, we can definitely improve. Um, and the Golden Geek nominations are open as well. I am not going to provide a link with that. Uh, you all know where Board Game Geek is. So, um, so if you, you have an opinion on any of this stuff, and you can abstain in any category you want. So, um, I'm, well, like I said, we're, we're, we're very happy with... Uh, with the numbers thus far, we are a large chunk of the way towards last year's final vote total. Let me put it that way, uh, a, a much farther along than I would necessarily expect. So, uh, you know, this is true of me, too, right? I mean, the first time I met Dean was at an Origins many years ago when the gamers were still attending Origins as a company. This obviously well predates um, their uh, acquisition for, by Multiman, um, and you know the, the the trays, the counter trays that we all, uh, you know, we all call me too GMT trays nowadays. I I first got those trays from the gamers, and I don't I haven't verified this, but the uh, I, I'm told that they're the actual like source for those was Udo Greeby games. I don't know if they're being independently sourced by other publishers who are selling them nowadays or not. So, so there you go. Exactly right. Uh, I'm not a, a eligible for any, um, golden geek thing that I'm aware of anyway. So if, if I am, nobody told me I have not yet, uh, watched this. I, I will give this a shot. I, the chances that I won't, end up liking it are actually quite high because I, unlike a lot of folks, I don't have any particular fondness for the Fallout property. I, I never really got into those games. Um, I will also mention, or I should say I will amplify Ed Holtzman mentioning that Worthington Publishing, so if you look at the Kickstarter, it won't say Worthington Publishing. I forget what it will say. I've looked at the Kickstarter already, but I don't have it up right now. Uh, you just search Kickstarter for Divine Right. This is the old board game that was produced by TSR in the early 70s or mid-70s, maybe. It's a kind of a legendary classic. It's been reprinted at least once. Um, Worthington Publishing has acquired the ability to do a very fancy version of it that includes expansion material and other stuff. Again, the Kickstarter won't be listed as Worthington Publishing, but whoever is listed is an arm of Worthington Publishing. So if you are in the market for a fantasy war game, um, and for some reason you either didn't get on Burning Banners or Burning Banners left you cold for whatever reason, it does look impressive, i got to be honest. Uh, Pungo Games, that is correct. Pungo Games, it is a, a division. I, I don't know if division is the correct term, um, but it is an appendage of some kind of Worthington Publishing. Um, I've heard good things about the Fallout show. I just, I don't know. I've, like I said, I'll give it a shot. Um, I, I don't have that much time to watch television. Um, I bought Oppenheimer digitally because I don't buy physical media anymore. And I buy very little. I'm happy to watch stuff on streaming. Um, the... And I haven't had the, I watched about half of it and I just, I haven't had the time to sit down and watch the rest of it. It's a great movie. I loved it. Uh, I saw it in the theater. Um, I have pre-ordered, and this may be the very first time I have ever done this, pre-ordered Dune Part 2, um, also digitally. I own the first one, again, digitally. Um, that is one that at least potentially I could see myself making an exception to the no physical media rule, um, just because... Um, I'm such a huge fan of the property. So, hey, yeah, you know, <laughs> buy it all, right? Why not? Vicky, thanks for stopping by. Uh, Jeff Beeler mentions that the Fallout show is not about recreating gameplay. It's a new story. Yeah, I would imagine that that's correct, but uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not that into dystopian fiction either, and it is dystopian. I... I find, as much as I liked it, I find this understandable be for a couple of reasons, one of which is just the directorial style that it is made in, um, which I could imagine some people not getting or not syncing with or not vibing or however you want to call that, or or or, or it seeming cheesy. Um, I can, uh, I, I could buy that, but I thought it was great. Uh, I am also paying laser attention to every time Jack Quaid shows up on screen as Richard Feynman. 
Um, he does not have a great deal to do, but the, the, the little he has is actually quite cool. So, all right. So Jonathan Dyer says that Pungo, which is not a great name. <laughs> I don't think it doesn't tell me anything. Is an imprint of Worthington. It's the name they released. There are no war game titles under like their new sports game. sports games. This is news to me. Okay. Um, this is true too. Uh, well, don't forget, it's it it really isn't an all star star studded ensemble too. Uh, and a lot of actors who have very little screen time are really important to the movie uh, to the story as presented. Remy Remy Malik, for example, plays David Hill. Um, who is absolutely critical in the way that uh, uh, Nolan tells the story. Um, and he has a total of maybe three minutes of screen time or something like that. Um, he is more important to the story than Jack Quaid's uh, Richard Feynman is. Let me put it that way. So, uh, see, I, 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 I think I can get this. This didn't bother me. I think I can, I think I can get this. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, so also remember that the first Fallout or two were very different games than what we see nowadays out of Bethesda. So um, so there's that, too. I just never got into it. I thought the whole like weird retro vibe was weird. Um, and uh, if I'm going to do... I'm not much of a fan of post-apocalyptic stuff. Let me put it that way. Um, however, that said, I will totally go see the new Mad Max... Furiosa thing because uh, Fury Road was awesome, so so there's that. This could be why actually this. That for all I know, this could well be named after the Pungo River, wherever that is. So big time kickboxing and big time hockey. Oh, apparently that's over now too. So don't don't come here for your Kickstarter news. There are whole channels that are dedicated to bringing you updates updates to Kickstarters. Um, and this is not one. Um, and, and we don't see that many Wargaming Kickstarters anyway. Um, I guess I'll also mention that I'm going to pull this up and I was not prepared for this either. Compass Games has at least one Kickstarter going right now. That is, and I'm actually going to throw this in the chat. This is Danny Parker's The Last Gamble. Um, if you would like to see the guts of this, um, A, stay tuned to this channel. But Mark, over at Clark Commando 1983, has already done an unboxing because he's got, I believe, the only copy that is out still out in the wild. And I've personally seen that copy um because it has been making the rounds rick de Girolami had it um a couple or whatever that was in february at winterfest uh, and i think that's the same copy they were playing at compass expo in in november as well uh, i am very excited about the game and uh i am very much looking forward to seeing it uh when it does arrive uh i'm not a fan of the moro project although it's an interesting premise i suppose um but part of that is the Morrow Project was one of those. We we tend to forget that this happened back in the day, and back it, the day in this context means like late seventies, early eighties. There were a number of role playing games that were popular regionally, and Morrow Project was one of them. Um, and uh, we're in the I think we're in the region where it was popular in the sort of upper Midwest, but. Um, but I never actually saw it until much, much later, right? Like the late 90s, maybe, or early 2000s. The Air and Armor Kickstarter is over. The uh, Last Gamble Kickstarter is still up. Now, the normal Compass Games Kickstarter process is it basically functions just as a late pre-order, right? So if you've already ordered it from Compass, don't worry about it. You don't have to reorder it again on Kickstarter. It's just there to drum up last minute, uh, last minute uh, pre-orders and say, you know, they got an extra 200 plus people buy an air and armor and at the economies uh, of scale that we operate at here in wargaming that's very significant i wouldn't take the funding the like the funding for any compass kickstarter that's not like a special kickstarter like burning banners was which is like a was like a real crowdfunding thing um 
they, they're just late pre-orders, so don't worry about it if it doesn't make its number. The numbers are set arbitrarily low so that they know the number will get made. So, okay, so Charles the Torres says, no more Gettysburg, uh, Normandy, Bulge, North Africa. Well, you know, we say stuff like this, and then we end up buying them anyway. And I, you know, I've said that a couple of times with, um, with, uh, bulge games specifically i've never said it about gettysburg how many gettysburg games do i have uh several i mean i don't have a million gettysburg games um but i've got i've got three days of gettysburg i've got mark herman's gettysburg out of c3i i've got avalon hills gettysburg which i think is this version from this i think it's gettysburg 77 um I've got Last Chance for Victory. I've also got Lee's Greatest Gamble, which uh, I had to have somebody send me the rules to that because it was a was in Command Magazine back in the day. And um, when I got it, and I only paid a, like a couple bucks for the magazine, it had every, it, everything's in there, the map, the counters, all the stuff, no rule book. Um, so I had to have somebody send me a PDF of the rule book, which is completely fine. Uh, this is a game that Gilbert Collins... Uh, regards very highly and i would uh, like to see it at so you know try to get it to a table at some point in my copious free time um in addition to the bullshit that we had um in the storm on friday so i guess i'll tell the story very briefly um on friday a big storm blew through and the power went out at about 8 p 7 or 8 p.m and it was out until about 11 i want to say um now, whenever this happens, right, we have we have an interesting situation here is that the power is out. I can't use the computer. Eh, who cares? However, we've got, you know, the fridge and the freezer. We got to be concerned about if it's out for a few hours, it's probably not that big of a deal. However, if it's raining and it was, I have to be concerned about the basement flooding. There are two sump pumps, <coughs> two sumps and two pumps in the basement Worst case scenario, I can bust the generator out and plug everything back in, right? But I monitor that very closely if the power goes out. I probably should have a battery backup system so I don't have to worry about it or if something happens when I'm out of the house. Um, but I was monitoring it very closely, and it never got quite bad enough for me to pull the generator out and get that started. At about 11 p.m., um, we were just laying down, and it, we heard a, a noise. And uh, the wife's like, uh, something just fell. We should go look. And I'm like, Fuck. all right. So I got the big flashlight out. I went out in, uh, I need a, a whole house generator, but those are very expensive. I have just a gas powered generator. Um, it is not that nice, but it will do in a pinch and I can plug, I can plug four or five things into it. Um, and for, if I plug the freezer into two sump pumps in, I'm covered. The other thing is we're on well water. Once the tank is empty, we got no water if there's no power. And if the power is going to be out for like a couple of days, like it was that one time, that's a prop. That's a big problem, right? If it's out for an hour or two, it's not big of a that big of a deal. So, um, uh, yeah, I have not picked up the Steam version yet. I will. I just haven't yet. Uh, and I, of course, have Rebel Fury, which we, you know, you've already seen the unboxing of that uh, for. So I go outside with the big flashlight. I got one of those super flashlights. Um, walk around, go out the garage, walk around the house. I'm like, eh, everything looks okay. That could have easily have been something at the, na the neighboring property. No problems. Walking around, walking around, walking around. Made almost about a 300 degree circuit before I saw, oh shit. Um, we lost a big tree. I would, I'm spitballing this, but I think the tree is about two to two and a half feet across. Um, on its way down, it hit two other trees, destroyed them. Um, the last tree, it kind of sheared all the branches off the one side coming down, and it hit the same shed that the previous uh, fallen tree had hit. So um, that is the world's unluckiest shed. So obviously with the power outage and all this other stuff, we, we you know, I missed the RuneQuest game, so apologies to all the... Uh, RuneQuest players for that, but we have rescheduled for two weeks, and we'll get to we'll get to that. And that's the that's the uh, Friday night before Buckeye Game Fest. Um, so Marty says uh, alternate circuit box for the house. <coughs> hook the generator into that. So here's the great thing: the house is wired for a generator already. I don't have to do any wiring. I just have to buy the generator. Um, 
but like I said, they're expensive, and I've got a, no, a, a lot of other stuff. There, there's also eight large, like larger than the ones that than the one that fell trees on the side of the house that are all within falling distance of the house, and I'm de- and they're all in very poor health, and the like that money that would go to a generator is going to go to a tree service to get those things pulled out of here because that's got to happen and it's got to happen this year. This is a good point. Um, I, I'm a little surprised that it hasn't, in neither case, has, and it's just, it's just like a cheap, tin, you know, uh, uh, steel sheet metal shed. Um, I'm actually surprised that it wasn't, in either case, totally flattened by uh, by the trees falling on it. So, so, Mark, thanks for stopping by. We will see you again soon. You have our best wishes. Uh, Aaron Dennis, thanks for stopping by. Finally uh, here for a live broadcast. We're probably not seeing each other this year because I think uh, neither of us are going to Compass Expo in uh, <clears throat> this year. So um, I've got um, the, the convention plans for me look like Buckeye Game Fest in a few weeks. Origins several weeks after that. Um, a field trip out to WBC again. Um, and which m- we might do more than over, we might do more than a day trip, but it's not going to be, I'm, I'm not, the money's not going to be there for the whole week. Um, so, uh, I'm not going for the entire time, but I, I will at least put it in an appearance and then SD HisCon in November. So, so anyway, no COVID expo. That's exactly right for fuck's sake. Um, uh, so the answer to this question, because this came up, right? The answer to this question is yes. However, the, the wind damage deductible is far higher, 10 times higher, in fact, than the regular deductible. Um, so it's covered. Uh, and if something catastrophic happens, it would be covered. We'd be up six grand, but, uh, Mark McNair is coming to Buckeye Game Fest. That's awesome. And that's just a couple, a uh, couple times. There are people going to, uh, to Compass Expo in, in May. So, uh, you know, some it depends where you are in the country, right? Some people don't have, ba- you know, the basements are not a thing. Here in Ohio, a lot of houses, not all houses, but a lot of houses have basements. So, um, and like I said, I, I you know, we do have um, two sumps. So if the, if the power is on, I'm not worried about the basement flooding particularly. There is one spot um, by the stairs, it's actually kind of weird. There's one spot by the stairs leading uh, into the basement that where I sometimes get a little bit of leakage if, if the rain is really astonishingly heavy. Um, but that hasn't really happened. Florida, uh, you can't have basements there because the base, because the house is below sea level. Um, and oh, yeah, and Foxconn, which is the official decision games uh convention is on the calendar now um there's a website for it i don't have that website handy hopefully i'll remember to do that um it is in the dallas area and that it's, it's probably gonna be a cool event it's gonna be limited to 100 people i know stigler's gonna be there so because he's he's you know he was a day one uh registry on on decisions uh, effort there so i love my basement this is a great basement um, and the nice thing is it's, it's cool, right? I don't have to worry about, uh, overheating down here. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so anyway, um, we've got, uh, do I have any, uh, any other business to take care of? I don't think I do. Um, so I guess I'll mention super chats and super stickers are on. So if anybody wants their comment highlighted, it's a great way to do that. It helps support the channel. Um, I don't have an update on the campaign for the finished trilogy because I have not gotten the latest data from Noble Knight yet. Uh, but I do want to give Noble Knight Games, the sponsor of the counter clipping show, a shout out. We will hear from them later. Um, I've always been a big fan of basements, but if they're if they're like super moldy, then that's nasty. And the 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 old place that we moved out of the basement was nasty. So a good basement is awesome. So campaign to abduct Stigler. Yeah, somebody's gonna pull into Foxconn at some point in Veterans Day weekend and they have Stigler in the trunk. So <laughs> you better drive because you're not getting that on an airplane. So, oh, you're you're gonna have enough people. Okay, so 
What's going on at Buckeye Game Fest? There's like five designers. I don't know who they are. Uh, I know Herman Lutman's going to be at Buckeye Game Fest. I think David Thompson's going to be there uh, because why not? He's like two hours. Actually, he's more like an hour and 20 minutes away. Um, but, but, um, but I know that we have um, uh, the big team coin game. Uh, the Players Aid guys are going to be there. They're going to be running some coin stuff. Um, plus some other stuff. Their latest video, they talked about exactly what they're doing, so go watch that if you're interested. I uh, can't wait to see those guys again. Wolf Dog's basement is Fieldstone from 1906. He's 6'8". The ceiling is six foot. So uh, my old basement actually had a partial, it was sort of like a weird split-level basement um, where you, you'd go down in the basement and the, the ceiling was at about right here, so about five 10 5 yeah about 5 10 or 5 9 um and um then you'd step down and there would be a lower area where you had a, a full i don't know if it was eight feet but it was at least you know i could stand up in it um and that basement was just a total nightmare and it was a an old, very old school basement the house had been built in 1941 so it was one of those like modular homes that was built during the war to accommodate workers at what was then i believe a tank factory um, which was right up the street from, you know, where we lived, but, uh, it was a shitty basement. Um, just huge moisture issues. Um, it was a super, super duper shitty basement. Um, this basement is not uniformly, you know, full height ceilings, but I'm not six, quite six feet. So I'm about five, ten and a and a half or something like that. I don't know. I'm probably shrinking by, by 20 years from now, I'm going to be the size of, uh, Tom Cruise. So I could totally understand this. There was another thing where if you're going down in the basement, you'd conk your head on the on the the sill plate. That was always fun. I don't have that problem here either. So the basement has a basement. If you've got a uh if 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 you've got a field stone basement that's from the first 30 years of the 20th century, I would call that a cellar personally, but that may not be the technically accurate term. So in any case, uh, I want to talk about how we find other war gamers at this point. And, and maybe lots of the folks here might not be super worried about that because they've got folks that they play with already. But we also hear, right, a lot of people play a lot of solitaire. And while that's, you know, uh, uh, an element of, of war game play for a lot of people, um, it's not necess a, a lot of people aren't fully satisfied by solitaire play. Let me put it that way. Um, Stigler aside, who has a religious objection to it, um, I have no problem with it, but I would I would always prefer to play something opposed if it's something you can play opposed, right? Um, so um, with that in mind, though, the, the traditional place to like find other gamers. Now, you know, we spent 10 or so years in Columbus, which is a very hopping gaming place from, from all angles, right? You want to play card games, you want to play board games, you want to play role-playing games, even war games. There's there's plenty of of people down there to do all of those things in, in different numbers, of course, but depending on what you're talking about, right? There's obviously more magic to gathering players than war gamers, but, you know, whatever. So traditionally, the place where you would go to like meet people who were into the kinds of games that you were into was the friendly local game store. However, not everybody has a friendly local game store. There are people who live in a remote location and they just don't have that available to them or their local game stores suck um, or their local game stores don't support the kind of games that they're interested in, which is very common for war gamers. So even in Columbus, we've got the Guard Tower, the Soldiery, and two or three other places. And other than the Guard Tower, you would never see anything other than the... And, and the Soldiery is a special case. I'll get to them in a minute. Um, other The Guard Tower would typically have whatever the new stuff from GMT is, and then maybe a handful of other things, like a DVG game, and maybe a couple things from Compass, or something like that. The Guard Tower is the, the place to go for current war games. Now, the soldiery has, you know, for years had war games. And until the, a few years ago, they had a decent selection of older stuff that was just like sitting around. 
Uh, but they appear to have dumped that and don't have really any of that anymore, as far as I could tell. So the, the trouble is that other than the guard tower, you know, there was really not a game store supporting wargaming down in Columbus. And in Columbus, we are luckier than most folks have. Not everybody's lucky enough to have a uh, a sentry box or a noble knight or a um complete strategist or a gamer's armory type of place that supports board wargaming, right? Most of them don't. Um, even so, I mean, think about how you and I buy war games, right? Do we normally buy those from a store anymore? I don't. I mean, I will occasionally, I will go to a brick and mortar store to buy a game just to support the brick and mortar store. And that's great. Um, but yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna restock the tray here. Um, we're using GMT trays for this. Strangely enough, the cube for me trays do not fit in the box. Uh, I mean, they will, if you turn them sideways, but I don't want to turn them sideways. Um, so the, the, the primary utility now more, you know, this isn't more true than it was, but this is more critical for the local game store now than it used to be. Um, the, the edge that the local game store has over the internet is as a social hub for the people that are playing the games that they sell right now, if the games that they sell, aren't the kind of games you're looking for, you're out of luck. Right. So, um, and that's the, you know, it, it, there's a decent number of even role-playing stores. I mean, we used to have in in when, where I I don't want to say grew up, but but prior to moving to Columbus, uh, up on the west side of Cleveland, we had a a really great uh, game store that had been around for quite a long time, um, and they did have some war games, and but they they had a lot of RPG stuff, um, and then uh, kind of all the oxygen got sucked out of the. Uh, atmosphere by Magic the Gathering and other things like that, and that store is no longer with us, unfortunately. So, um, a lot of game stores have gone the way of the dodo, let me put it that way. So, if I'm ordering stuff, I will every once in a while, I mean, we're talking war games now. If it's RPGs, it's a little different, because you could potentially, depending on what it is, you could potentially get it from Amazon at a substantial discount. You really can't do that with war games, right? So, um, I would say most of, okay, most is not, it's not the right word. The great majority of the new war games that I pick up are just pre-ordered directly from whoever the publisher is, okay? If it's GMT or Multi-Man or Compass or, or uh, Decision or whatever, right? I'll just get it from them. Um, if it's new and there's a disc, you know, pre-order discount or something like that. I'm tr kind of trying to be restrained about that, but, you know, there's only so much I can do. On the other hand, um, the, all right, so Stigler has, cost of shipping is an issue, but there's ways around it too. Noble Knight, if you, so if you buy from Noble Knight, let me, let me finish making this statement before I, before I say this. Um, so in the last year or so, not necessarily before that, but in the last year, probably two thirds of the games that have been coming into this place have not been newer games. They have been older games purchased from a variety of different places. So damn it. Sometimes at a convention, sometimes through no more often through noble night, sometimes enterprise games, um, or eBay. Right. And you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I don't want to say patient. Patient's not the right word because I don't enjoy waiting. Um, but I'm I'm very selective about eBay because you never know, really know what you're going to get. Um, you don't have any guarantee of, hey, there's a problem. You Can you help me fix it? You don't have any guarantee that that's the case. I've, I haven't really had a lot of problems personally. Um, but I will point out that, yes, shipping costs are a problem. But if you order from Noble Knight and you order over 100, I think it's $149, shipping is free. And even if it's under $149 and you had to pay to ship, as I, I will ex explain in a moment, it's still like 8 or $9. It's very reasonable. So one of the things that has been on my wish list for several years, and it's just never come up at a price I wanted to pay until like this weekend, 
Um, I did not have any store credit to use. I, I may have had a couple bucks in store credit, but uh, 1812, SPI's 1812, which I want to say is a John Young design, is very interesting game. Um, came up for, I think, 50 on, and I'm like, well, I guess I got to buy that. So I, I ordered it, and it's on its way, and it should be here this week. Um, I had previously seen a copy in what I take to be roughly equivalent condition, uh, sell on eBay for like a hundred plus dollars. So I've considered that a, a, a really good price. Uh, and I was just like, you know what? This is not going to last. I'm just going to order this. So screw it. I ordered it. Didn't want to pay cash, but it was only 50, $59 or whatever it ended up being. So, Ugh. yeah, this is gross. That's eh, disgusting. So I was buying a, a lot of war game. Maybe a lot is not an accurate statement, but it was a lot to me at the time. Okay. At one point, my primary online war game supplier, well, other than the publishers themselves, was Cool Stuff, um, who carried uh, multi man stuff. Now, I also had occasionally picked something up from stuff up from Miniature Market, which I real, even relatively recently I've ordered stuff from Miniature Market just to get like card sleeves and stuff like that. Um, uh, miniature market. Uh, so miniature market just changed ownership. Um, so I don't know if this will still be the case. Uh, but as most recent uh, that I'm aware of, Noble Knight, uh, sorry, miniature market did have a free shipping threshold of I think a hundred dollars. It might have been 150. And cool stuff did too. And that was an incentive to order from them and to order a couple of things because then we need free shipping, right? Um, cool stuff uh, has basically phased out everything, but. Uh, but cards at this point, as far as I can tell, um, they the war games were the first to go. So I haven't ordered anything from cool stuff in eons. Um, no, Mar miniature market still has like GMT and Compass and Worthington and some stuff like that. But if you have, um, you know, if, if you're looking for selection, Noble Knights, where to go? Um, I miss NWS online too, but what I don't miss is waiting six months to get my shit that I ordered. Um, that was that was tiring. I have not looked at their website for a bit, so I can't really speak to this. Uh, but at this point, um, this is based other than the publishers. This is basically where and eBay. This is basically where I'm at. Uh, I would say ninety percent of what I buy now comes from Noble Knight um, for a number of reasons. One. For all the talk about how their prices are super duper high, I mean they certainly are on some things, but those are things that 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 are that's what they're worth, right? Um, Fifty bucks for eighteen twelve unpunched, I thought was was very good, um, considering that I've been keeping my eyes out for that for a number of years. Um, so, and at this point, you know, I, I, I thanks to thanks to the help of the folks here tonight and and other folks. I've been able to, uh, you know, use store credit for that too. So Noble Knight store uh, affiliate link in the video description. So if you uh, use it, it will go towards, this is going to be an incredibly unimpressive graphic, but uh, the campaign for the campaign for the finished trilogy, um, which we are at 0% because I just have, I'm waiting for the data from, from Noble Knight. So thanks Noble Knight. And you can help the channel out by buying that stuff you were going to buy anyway through the affiliate link. So, and a little bird has told me there may be a sale coming up, but I don't know what that sale looks like yet. And it's probably, it's, it's a few weeks out yet. So like, uh, probably closer to a month. So, and I don't know what's going on sale. It could be certain things could be everything. I don't know. Usually Noble Knight has a pretty big sale roughly annually where a lot of stuff is discounted. So anyway. All right, and and the other thing is, um, um, just looking at the chat here. Okay, so Grant says the cool stuff made a big public statement that they were bailing on almost everything but cards slash card accessories because they couldn't compete with Amazon. Um, well, uh, Amazon really doesn't sell war games. I mean, yes, you can get GMT games at basically retail price on on uh, Amazon. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked, so maybe this has changed, but I don't think so. Uh, but unless it's GMT or maybe Compass or somebody like that, good luck. Um, 
So I believe this is true, but they also didn't do what they could have done, which was to, you know, as the war game market enough to keep them afloat, I doubt it. Uh, you know, Noble Knight certainly emphasizes war games more than any other online retailer that I'm aware of other than enterprise games. This is probably bullshit because you've got groups like Ritter Krieg and stuff like that, too. Um, Grey Rooster is very good. Here, he's local here, local-ish. Um, so, you no, know, they won't let you go pick stuff up, but but that's okay. <clears throat> Uh, but he doesn't carry everything either, right? Noble Knight has fucking everything. So at least sooner or later. And yeah, I, it, Russ ought to be here, actually. Russ Russ would be one of the people I would talk about this. I, I do, I mean, it's, I'm not going to be sailing, saying anything particularly revelatory here um, when I say that nowadays, I think when people make connections to other gamers, they are largely doing so online. Um, where are the, pl and that's kind of where I'm going with this, right? Barring the friendly local game store that serves as a social hub for locals, where do we go, right? Um, we, there used to be a thriving ecosystem of people looking for opponents in the classified section of magazines like the general and stuff. Um, you know, a good decade worth of people met a lot of their opponents that way. Um, nowadays, not, we don't really have as nearly as many print magazines as we used to, and certainly nothing as you quite as ubiquitous <coughs> as the general, but <coughs> also I have a cold, so <coughs> if I don't sound particularly froggy, hopefully I can get through the show here. Um, so, uh, nowadays you've got a couple of different social hubs. You've grogdar.com is still around somehow. Um, Consim world, of course, is still around with its primitive interface that it has had for many decades. Um, and there's board game geek, which has what I would not describe as an ideal interface, but it's better than Consim worlds. Um, <clears throat> you've got like threads on board game geek to find vassal opponents, for example, or you can ask in a given games specific forum. Um, I think I, there's, there's a number of, there's a really large number of Facebook groups dedicated to war gaming, right? And they range in size from 10 people to 10,000 people or more than 10,000 people sometimes. Um, so you can go to, as somebody mentioned, a thread, the Facebook Opponents Wanted uh, thread and or group, I should say, and, and check that out. And you've got a pretty good chance of finding somebody. <coughs> so Stalingrad Rose from Game Nerds. I'm not familiar with Game Nerds. Uh, William Aaron says in Kitchener, which is in Canada, for those not in Canada, uh, you have a great board games. There's a warehouse rather than a walk-in store. There's one board game cafe that doesn't specialize in board games. We got some, there's, well, I don't want to help here. No, there is a board game cafe here in Northeast Ohio, at least one that I'm aware of. There might be more. Um, and there's at least two or three in Columbus. Uh, but none of those specialize in war games. And they will look at you like you're an absolute lunatic if you walk in with a copy of Case Blue, for example. So... Uh, Gamers Armory does have a full selection of a <coughs> ASL, whatever's available for ASL time, right? All right, Jeff Beeler had a subscription to Moves. Um, another thing I noticed, uh, somebody asked, might have been Mark Ruggiero, who asked if um, Fire and Movement was available digitally, and like the first 10 or 15 or something like that issues of uh, Fire and Movement are available on uh, Wargame Vault for anybody interested in that. But unfortunately, the magazine ran a lot longer than that, so it doesn't, uh, you know, that's not the whole run or anything like that. I had a desire to pick up some some uh, some issues just for research material, and um, Nations in Arms 2nd Edition. It's not really a 2nd Edition, unless we're talking about different games. Um if we're talking about the Compass Nations in Arms, which I have a pretty high, which I haven't played, but tentatively I have a pretty high opinion of. I certainly put a lot of effort into 
uh, an elaborate 3D printed storage solution for it and custom printed manuals and all that. Uh, the second, it's not even a second printing. It's just like a, it was just like a restock where they assembled, I don't know, a few dozen extra copies and it, they put it back at for sale. Uh, but they did reprint the rule book and they updated the rule book. So it does have updated rules, but you can still get other updated rules. Uh, this is complicated uh, on BGG site for Nations in Arms. And I do feel like it's, it's very much a kitchen sink design. It's got like something and everywhere, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a hex encounter game. Um, it's got a fairly sophisticated naval system as games about the Napoleonic Wars go. Um, it covers the uh, revolutionary period, so the first and the wars of the first and second coalition, which most uh, of the most Napoleonic strategic level games do not. They mostly start in eighteen, almost exclusively, they start in eighteen oh five. You can actually start uh, Nations in Arms in seventeen ninety two or three. Uh, but there's no contiguous campaign taking you from the beginning of the French Revolution all the way through to 1815. It's two separate campaigns. It's more than that, but you know what you know what I'm saying. Uh, you can buy off a note from Noble Knight off of Amazon or eBay for that matter. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who's going to do the Canadian Ice Tea video with Mo. Um, we'll have Mo. I'll leave that up to Mo. Right. So. All right, so Multi Cartel Games says other board game publishers are copying GMT on Amazon, so it's retail and usually have to pay for shipping. Like I said, uh, Amazon was such a bad place to buy war games, barring GMT stuff, um, f- for a long time that I have not looked at it lately. Maybe the landscape has changed. Um, the other thing is that this guy is different. Who are these guys? I think these are Cal. Yeah, these are cavalry leaders. Uh, there's no cavalry symbol on the on the counter. They just put the stars in parentheses, which is not an iconography that I like. Kevin Bertram, thanks for stopping by. Um, well, Kevin, you are the publisher, though. So, I mean, that's that's kind of cheating, right? I just, I usually, I mean, if it's something new, I'll buy direct for the publisher as well, though. That's, I think that's completely reasonable. That way you're doing the most to support the publisher. And as much as we'd like to support the friendly local game store, we'd like to support the publishers. Uh, Because chances are, with some exceptions, chances are our friendly local game store does not support war games. So, this has turned into more a discussion about shopping than networking, though. Uh, you are not alone in this, and yet every time somebody suggests, even in the mildest possible terms, revamping the site so that it has a more modern and accessible layout, uh, the denizens there go absolutely out of their fucking minds. So, I don't... Oof. All right, so Asmodee is now owned by somebody else. Um... I don't have a high opinion of Asthma Day, but part of that is that they, they, they just don't produce games that I'm interested in, which is which should not be read as an indictment of them, but just, you know, that's fine. Um, when I hear the name Lion Rampant, however, I do not think of whoever you're talking about. I think of the Lion Rampant that got uh, absorbed by White Wolf back in the late 80s or early 90s or whatever that was, mid-90s perhaps. Uh, that were the original publisher of Ars Magica, one of my favorite RPGs to this day, um, even though I'm not sure I would run it again, uh, but I'm not sure that I wouldn't. So I still have all the, all the, well, not all, but all I, I never got rid of Ars Magica. Well, I did, but, th- but I bought it again, and I haven't gotten rid of it since then. So, all right, so Brian Foley says that Game Nerds is similar to Miniature Market. Not familiar with that at all. All right, so Lion Rampant is perhaps a Canadian distributor. Is that what's going on here? So this is true. However, one of the one of the reasons I'm going to segue this. Okay, so one of the reasons why I don't buy from Amazon war games from Amazon anymore is because I know where to go for war games that isn't Amazon, where they have either a better better selection, better service, better prices, or all, or, or you know, or several of the above, all right? Um, that said, <clears throat> also, I'm going to point out these counters of center nibs. I friggin' hate center nibs, but that aside. 
Um, there's almost always more people available for face-to-face -face play in your area than you think. Now, maybe you don't know those people, and maybe you do live in, you know, the wilderness of Mon northern Montana or something like that, and there's just, like, legitimately no civilization around you, in which case maybe you're hosed. That's actually why I set this this up as networking, because the, because the thing here is to find the people, right? I've got a pretty good idea of where to find people. And for me, it's not a problem to find people anymore. I say, hey, I, got, I want to run a room quest. I need four people. I got 10 people inquired about that. So I had to say no to six of them or five of them anyway. I did squeeze an extra person in. Um, however, as Stigler points out, you don't necessarily, your, your opponent doesn't necessarily need to be local. And I will, and we've been through this territory before, I, I will prefer playing with physical components, with physical people in a physical room, over playing on Vassal. However, if if it's Vassal or just play with myself, I'll, yeah, I'm happy to play with Vass, on Vassal, right? So, uh, I'm reasonably sure there are places to... Uh, so the, the thing is that you it, it's a lot harder to find a general gaming partner than a specific gaming partner. And let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say I want to play war games and I put a card up at the local friendly local game store. Opponents wanted for war games, tabletop war games. Uh, you know, assuming you can make it clear that you're not talking about miniatures, you might get some some bites on that. But let's say you say, looking for opponents and nations in arms. Well, chances are that nobody reading that card on the wall at the store in the local in the local game store knows what the hell that is, right? Um, we don't have um, the sort of central experience in wargaming that we used to in the, say, the 70s, where, you know, it, whatever Avalon Hill did that year was definitely going to be a big thing because they only produced one or two games a year. Um, and it was very easy to kind of keep your eye on everything that was happening between Avalon Hill. SPI was, of course, massively exceeding that level of output. Uh, the task for God, God, task force games forum. Is there a task force games for task force games is toast. What are you talking about? Oh, there you go. Uh, Rogue 77 sold nations and arms unplayed and unpunched for $99. I've got the, I've got the second printing myself, but I printed off the banana man or whatever the guy's called, uh, rule book off of BGG and we'll play with that. It's basically the same game. It's just rewritten rule book. Um, there is, uh, to some extent, I mean, there is good content on, on constant world. There's no doubt about that. Um, there's also a lot of, bullshit you got to wade through to get to the good content in a lot of cases um and that's something that i probably am minimally interested in in dealing with uh to be honest uh i gotta tell you this is not that horrible of a price um is it the best price you're gonna find now no it's not but it is it's it's not an outlandish price um uh, a friend of a friend is the a sort of a friend of a friend of a friend uh, is the person that sold that to Noble Knight Games. So I might have a little more insight as to exactly what kind of condition it is that you'll necessarily see in Noble Knight's listing. Um, but uh, I this this was the price I was thinking I was going to end up paying, and I just happened to be very fortunate in that it came up lower than that. So. Basically, yeah. Um, I mean, there's folders, and you can look in the folders, and then each folder is its own decades-long thread. Really? That's pretty awesome. I mean, we buy a lot of shit from Amazon, just not normally gaming stuff, to, like games. Um, every once in a while, I'll buy a, a gaming thing from Amazon, like those plastic placard holders that I bought. Like, they're office supplies, right? Um, from Amazon, we, we're you know we're on we're Amazon Prime people. We, we we buy, I mean, almost every day. It feels like it's probably not quite this often, but it feels like almost every day something shows up from Amazon. I remember when when the only thing one went to Amazon for was books. Oh, this is interesting. So Paulson says there's various meetups that so there's there's there is meetup. Yeah, there's that's a website meetup dot 
Tom, I ex expect. Um, and you could check that out too. Uh, you might find, I don't know where Sterling Heights is, but you could, you might be able to find a, a local meetup group that is, that is doing war games. Now you might show up and figure out it ain't the kind of thing you're into, um, cause they're playing risk or something. I don't know, but, uh, Hey, it's worth a, worth a shot. There is an, uh, I don't know if this group is back on the track or not. Right before the pandemic, I, I think I had gone to two of their meetings. There was a local ASL group that was meeting monthly in Columbus at a rotating local library. Um, and then we had, got hit with the pandemic, and that all went in the toilet. Uh, Amazon ships, Amazon's packing discipline sucks, let me put it that way. You'll, you'll order a tiny thing, it'll come in a huge box with no packing at all. I Mark McNair says the war game publishers are not selling on Amazon. I am positive this. There's at least one exception I can think of, and that is Mike Lambeau. Um, but other than that, um, and, and actually Worthington, uh, when they've done the book games, um, they have sold directly through Amazon. But barring that kind of thing, um, yes, these are all independent sellers, and you're not necessarily getting a bargain price. All right, trying to figure out where we are in the chat here. Uh, I am positive this is the case. John, I'm amazed John has a hair up, uh, left on his head, to be honest, as much as he's doing. Um, I, I, am, I am exhausted just being in the same room as John. You know what I'm saying? So who are the five-star Union Generals here? Hold on a second. We got, uh, okay, McClellan, Grant, and Halleck. That does sort of make sense. And there's a... About twice as many uh, four-star generals here. I don't. I don't believe that for a second that John's not aware of the challenges based on the forum software they're using at Gonson World. I don't believe that for a second. But every time John makes the slightest peep about changing it, people go nuts. Uh, and and this is you know this is part of the dynamic here. Rob Johnson says. People always go nuts when they, people, you change the UI. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. People didn't people didn't like it when they changed the UI over at uh, over at BGG either, and they did relatively recently. It, it it wasn't that radical of a change because they didn't need quite that radical of a change. Aaron Dennis says the concept world needs a zero based reset, and John is incredibly busy, um, <clears throat> and I'm certainly not helping him out with that. Oh, there you go. There was a, a, a set of miniatures rules called Lion Rampant 2. I'm not sure I knew that uh, Osprey did that. Uh, William Aaron says that they do promote the games of Mike Lambeau. Um, and he's got a whole bunch of stuff at this point. There's there's tons of good information on Consum World. No question. It's just finding it is the problem. Sir. I, I'm aware that there's a search feature. The search sucks. It sucks. Uh, there is a new edition of Atlas uh, of Ars Magica coming. It's been an idle property from Atlas for a long time. Um, and they're going to do a new edition of it. They're, they're going to kickstart, I think, sometime either this year or next year. Um, I think it's going to be like an edition 4.5 or something like that. Um Probably the first three or four books that they did for Ars Magica 5th edition, I'm in the book as a playtester. So, <clears throat> uh, and I generally, uh, I've kind of lost track of what Atlas is up to, and that's why, because the game that they made that I liked, they, they've continued to sell it. They never, like, phased it out or anything, and you can buy all this stuff digitally on drive-thru or wherever, um, although I have hard copies of basically all that stuff, uh, but... Um, Atlas seems to be a lot more interested, generally speaking, in board games now, um, and not the kind of board games I'm into. So, I don't know if everybody would, but I think that would be a, a, a very small minority opinion if you say, if you like found some person who just preferred to play with Vassal. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, there's people who have to play on Vassal for a variety of different reasons. Um, 
if they have tremors, for example, uh, that they're going to have a hard time with physical components and they might, they might find a virtual interface to be easier to deal with. If they have significant, I know at least one or two people like this, if really significant vision problems for whom Vassal is way easier solution to deal with than physical components, particularly physical components with half inch pieces. Now, I'm still on board with half inch pieces, but I also got to make sure that, that the lighting is exceptional. And that's why the lighting in this room is exceptional. Um, one might, uh, uh, when I, when I installed those lights, I, I said, honey, come on down and check out the lights. I just put up in the war room. It's great. She comes down and she's like, they can see this fucking room from space. Are you kidding? This, this is insanely bright. So, All right, so John C. plays a lot of combat commander on Vassal. John, I'm so sorry. Uh, you have my deepest condolences. All right, Vince Reese says it's again. It's got good content, but it's 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 just so hard to it's hard figuring out the interface is isn't. So I don't think people are trying to say that they're just baffled by the interface. I think people are trying to say that they can't figure out how to find the thing that they're looking for. Yeah, so here you go. Papa, at least 20 people in, in the chat here from the greater Tampa area. Uh, I don't know when it, when where any of these landmarks are. <laughs> um, no, none of them have met. None has a local game store. Get together, play some games, you know? It, it, that, that's, that is the question of how you make those connections. Somebody has put in a super chat. Fine games used to sell some more games on Amazon. And my understanding was they were pretty good. I think I bought one or two things from them at one point. They were a pretty good uh, retailer, but the guy retired. The, the folks retired, and it is no longer a a uh, a running business. Let me put it that way. All right, John Stanley, thank you so much. Much uh, much appreciated. Uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. I feel like I have forgotten uh, or missed in the chat exactly what we were talking about. Uh, so they just, this, the Foxconn link just came up like in the last couple of days. So, um, that site, it, it's not like that site's been around for months. Um, it, it is a matter of maybe a week. Well, that's legal here. Now they're not that kind of lights and I don't need that kind of lights to be honest. Uh, I've got two of those big garage, fucko seen it. Uh, I've got two of those like multi-panel garage LED lights, um, and it's it's bright. It's really bright. Uh, to the uh, point that I have I, I have to sometimes be concerned about shadows, and I always have to be concerned about reflections uh, if I'm doing videos in that room. Ah, yeah. Uh, so this is another thing, but this is not this this creates challenges. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the traffic, like the game specific traffic that at one point would have been on sort of a general purpose site, whether that general purpose site is Consum World or BGG or RPG net or whatever has migrated to discord. Now I like discord. Okay. And, um, anybody wants a link to my discord community, let me know. Um, but um, the, I'm trying to figure out how I want to, uh, uh, approach saying this. The problem with discord is that unless you are in a given discord community, the contents of that discord community are totally invisible to you. That is not the case with something like BGG or Consum world or whatever, where you don't have to be, if you might be, maybe you got to sign up to see the posts. Um, but but every, once you do that, everything is there. Now, on the other hand, if I go to the WIF, which he, Vincenzo is right, the, the WIF uh, Discord server is very good. Um, <clears throat> unless I know that, you know, where that is and where I can get an invite to that Discord uh, community, I just don't know. There's, there's like no way to find it, right? Um, unless the people running it have seen fit to, you know, promote that location. And sometimes they do. Uh, but a lot of times those communities are really hard to find. So what I think that has resulted in, at least part of the time, is a great deal of siloing in these really specialized interests 
um, and whose whose conversations and resources and all that stuff becomes invisible to everybody else. You could troll for opponents right here. I totally will not object in any way. Let me let me put it that way. You can meet people by going to conventions, but they might not be local people either, right? Um. <clears throat> All right, Brant, thanks uh, so much. Much appreciated. Uh, Brant says, and uh, we've done this too. Uh, this is, the, the, they're less friendly to setting up Case Blue, I'm afraid. Uh, but you can normally reserve a library conference room for a, an evening and, you know, do something um, and have that room all to yourselves. And if you play a, a one-sitting game of any kind or a game that doesn't require you to leave stuff set up, um, then I mean I've I've seen a lot of role playing groups for example meet at libraries the ASL people met at libraries but they're not setting up red barricades either they're setting up a one or two map thing that's going to take them three it's anywhere between one and five hours to play and then that's that right and this is kind of where I'm going with this Stigler is is it it's a little hard to find unless you know where you're going already same thing with Consum World right. You, if you know where to go, cool. You you know where to go already. But it's it's hard to find the Discord server you're looking for. But that said, off the top of my head, I am aware of. I'm gonna I'm gonna dramatically hold on. I'll, I'm I'm actually gonna pull up Discord and I'll I'll tell you how many wargaming Discord servers I'm in. Now Discord is updating. Fantastic. And, you know, there's no reason to think that any of these are are aware of one another. All right. So I've got the Ardwolf's Lair Discord server, okay? Legendary Tactics has a Discord server, Compass Games. Uh, there's an OCS Discord server. There's a Coin Discord server, World in Flames. There's a Consim World Discord server. GMT has a Discord server. Uh, World at War has one. ASL has one. There's probably more than one. GCACW. Uh, there's one called Hex Encounter, which looks like it might have spun out of Reddit. Uh, there's one for Vassal. There's one. There's the Armchair Dragoons have one. The International Kriegspiel Society has one. These are all what, just ones that I'm in. Uh, Dungeon Musings does not belong in this category. Uh, there's a Gamers Civil War game. So Civil War Brigade and Line of Battle uh, and whatever else are in that uh, 10K games. You'll be hearing more from them in the future. You probably haven't heard much so far. Um, Grand Tactical Series. Here's a La Bataille series. Eric, I think, sent me into that. Um, there's a Rally of the Troops Discord. The War Council, which is, you know, kind of a bunch of, just a bunch of like-minded people. SD Histcon has one. Uh, the War Room has one. Uh, Mark Herman has one. Um, and that's just what I'm in, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I don't think I'm leaping tremendously to say that there's probably another 30 that I'm not aware of, um, that I am not a member of, and then probably another 60 that I am not aware of and don't need to be a member of because I'm not interested in whatever it is that they do. So I'm going to try and get caught up on the chat, folks, while we hear from the sponsor of the counterclipping show, Noble Knight Games. So take it away, Noble Knight. Here at Noble Knight Games, we've been carefully growing the world's largest selection of board games, role-playing games and dice, war games, miniatures and paints, card games, and more. Going on 25 years now. Our rustic castle contains more game and hobby goodness than you can shake a stick at. Complete with careful packaging and the finest customer service the land can provide. You can buy, sell, trade from anywhere in the world. Just like nature intended. Noble Knight Games. All right. Thank you, Noble Knight, for being the sponsor of the Counter Clipping Show. Great, great selection. Great folks. Great customer service. Um, all right. And, uh, yeah, Fred has a, uh, a big Discord thing happening. Am I not in that? I thought I was in that, but maybe I'm not. Um, so yeah, well, the point is that, that nobody can find these things. So John Tolan had a bad experience. So I feel like you've got to clearly communicate this stuff, especially if you're playing with people. Well, you're playing fundamentally with people you don't know a lot of the time on Vassal, right? So it, it's important in that situation to clearly communicate expectations, right? Um, if, if you tell your opponent, Hey, I'm just trying to learn this. 
Um, and they're not cool with that. They can tell you, well, I, yeah, I'm really looking for an experienced opponent. Okay, that's I I personally, if if I got that response, I would I might be disappointed, but I would not be angry about it. I'd be like, okay, well, that's you know, we're we're not looking for the same thing. I, I'll I'll keep looking, and you know, I'll maybe go back to one of those resources we mentioned. The uh, opponents wanted a uh, group on facebook or the wargaming vassal thread on uh bgg for example so all right so alistair mentions and i already riffed on this but uh fred uh, over at homo ludens has a lively discord i thought i was in that maybe they threw me out i don't know um brant says anyone in community distance to rtp area i assume that if you're in the rtp area you know what the rtp area is but apparently it's in north carolina so they have a thing at Gamers Armory. Uh, Dungeon Musings is a is a YouTube channel actually. That's but it's like a D and D YouTube channel, and I'm not really sure why I'm in their Discord, but um, it could be an S and M site, but it is not. Is there a Discord server index page listing all the servers? How many? So there might be a, like a, a master directory of Discord servers, but how many Discord servers do you think there are? 150,000? I mean, I think I think that's approximately the number you're probably looking at if it's it could it could be 10 times that. I have no idea. Um so the, again, the question becomes, how do you find the things that you are looking for, right? So, and you know, I I I will also say, you know, to to get back to what John no John Nolan's experience um, it goes without saying that there's nimrods in every social circle, right? So that that's really not weird. It's unfortunate, but it's you know it's not weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I'm aware that you people down there know what the acronym is. Uh, maybe I'm missing remembering what Dungeon Musings does. I thought it was mostly D and D or all D and D, but I could be wrong about that. Maybe that's why I'm there is because if it's if it's a just D and D channel, chances are I'm not paying much attention to it. Um, I subscribe to a pretty small number of YouTube channels that I would describe as D and D YouTube, like D and D focused YouTube channels, and not channels that talk about D and D from time to time. Um, that's probably uh, Matt Colville, uh, who's an old acquaintance from the R- old days on RPG Net, um, and Greyhawk Grognard, um, and there's probably another couple that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Greyhawk Grognard is going to do. I think he's planning. On, I think this will come out this month. Is, is going to do a Kickstarter for a second edition of his RPG, Adventures Dark and Deep. Um, which is a bit of a riff on first edition AD and D. Um, if you if that is your jam, first edition AD and D, I probably think you ought to give that a, a, a decent look. Adventures Dark and Deep is the name of the game. There's a if you think about it for more than a second or two, you'll see why that's amusing. Um pro, does Felicia Day, I mean, I'm not stalking Felicia Day. Uh, does does she have a disc her own Discord community? I mean I'm not saying that's unlikely. I'm saying I have the vaguest idea. And if in that kind of situation, I'd be concerned about if you're like an actual celebrity and I consider Felicia day, an actual celebrity. Um, if you're an actual celebrity, as opposed to a gaming celebrity, which is a little, the, the bar is a little lower what I'm saying. Um, then I would think that, um, I'd be more concerned about like actual lunatics in my, you know, communities, then uh those are all leaders those will go in this tray so well so the other thing with discord is it's kind of a combination thing right um on the one hand you you have the ability to um meet people and have discussions and stuff like that and on the other hand you can run all your stuff just on discord because it's got video conferencing and and um <clears throat> And let's see here. Oh, poop, I did it wrong. Uh, it's got video conferencing and all that stuff built right in, right? At the moment, we are just sorting these by leaders with numbers of stars. Um, 
we're going to rethink that once I've actually gone through how the leader system works again. Oops. Cavalry leaders, naval leaders. All right, I'm going to be able to get this entire game. It is five and a half counter sheets. I'm going to get it all into three trays. Um, and that's basically all Union units in one tray, all Confederate units in another tray, all generic markers and leaders in a third tray. And then the variant leader markers, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to handle that yet. Uh, since I have to read those rules. That is a leader system that's a little more similar, as I recall, a little more similar to the leader system from um, Victory Game Civil War. The soundboard in Discord. I don't even know what this is. Uh, I, I am aware of, during the pandemic, <clears throat> I'm just I'm just trying to think exactly what the situation was, but this was during the pandemic. I started playing Eve Online again, and um, I was rather surprised that this wasn't a million years ago, right? I was rather surprised at the time that the corp that I joined was using Teamspeak. Um, I had never used Teamspeak before, and I have not used it since. Uh, squeakiest counters? No, it's the Clipper. It's the Clipper. And there's forums, too. Uh, this is a good point, right? Um, I mean, fundamentally, what Brandt is doing is not dissimilar, although it is on a smaller scale, um, to what Consim World is doing. Other, Well, uh, and also Brandt so software is better than Consim World software. Um, so there's that. Uh, so, yeah, Armchair Dragons has forums that are pretty lively, too. It's not like it's ghost town, right? So WhatsApp can be used, Skype can be used. Um, I don't like, yeah, or or uh, Zoom is another one that uh, that we can do. Uh, Mike, we are doing um, war between the states. Uh, the the decision war between the states. My SPI war between the states is already punch clipped and organized. I'm trying to use the SPI trays when I have them, uh, and I have a decent extra supply of extras um i'm trying to use the spi trays where possible right now i'm not talking about the flats i'm talking about the ones that came in the boxes um however the lids do not attach very well i'm very concerned about uh jackson and corinth here for example and that's actually why it's not back on the shelf because i don't want to set it on its side and then find a giant mess when i get back um <clears throat> i have to verify it too that's the other thing is i uh am i right yeah, Corinth is verified. Jackson at the crossroads is not yet verified. So uh, I, I used uh, PHPBB or whatever that is uh, when I was briefly running a forum. Uh, that's a huge amount of work. Even just running any website. I'm Brant, I, I, I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, actually. Uh, how do you deal with spammers and all that? So just just not, I'm not even technically the web minister, right? Uh, or the web uh the webmaster for the Charles S. Roberts Award site, and we get t anywhere between 10 and 30 bullshit. This is like bots filling out the contact form, right? There isn't even an email address on there, but the bot, you know, the contact forms comes in and it's, you know, loose Russian women want you now uh, type of shit that I have to paw through. I don't really do it every day, but, uh, but, but I mean, how do you even deal with that? I mean, John Madison probably is in search of a good answer to this question, too, because for the Winterfest, he runs the Winterfest website, and he has to deal with that, uh, uh, and it's a huge hassle. And that's a little bit less, a little more straightforward site than the CSR site, because we've got a couple different things. At no point do we intend to put forums on there, by the way. So... All right, so Brand says he's got a couple of plugins that help filter against known spammer accounts plus registration questions. Now, I might ask you about this offline then. Uh, this is true too. Um, paying your, running your own forums is you do have to be concerned about how much space and bandwidth you have available too. Um, you could just, if you run a forum, you could just not allow pictures and attachments. That's not necessarily a big deal, but that also limits the 
use of that site, right? So one of the neat things that you could do on BG, this is a huge strength of BGG, by the way. Let's say that I have developed a uh, scenario cards for uh, Onda Richmond. I can just upload them to BGG. I mean, assuming I'm not being an asshole about it and have some copyrighted Im images in it or something, um, then I can just upload it, upload it to BGG. <clears throat> From a technical standpoint, this can be done on Concept World as well. However, you have to find who the owner of the group, is, the folder is, and then talk to them, and then they can post it up there. You don't have to deal with that for BGG. You do have to wait for your file to get approved, but th that, you know that's normally a day or maybe two. So uh, they might be. They're they're the right in voters clearly. Game box was ga game box. Was that the one that Callendale was running? I might re refresh my memory on that, Adam Mech. Um, I I feel like that's what that was, and I was I think I popped in there once or twice, and um, and I think that's defunct now, if I'm not mistaken. So, Game Squad, A. -Cri a -E Cryptal mentions Game Squad for ASL now. Game Squad appears to be mostly a not wargaming site to me uh, that happens to have a big ASL, big active ASL section in it. Uh, so I'm not sure what's up with that. But if I was looking for ASL opponents specifically, yeah, I would send people here. Uh, Marty says he waited almost a month for the BGG mods <laughs> to approve the winners. So I have no idea what the scope is on on uh, like getting pages approved. That's a little different. If you're just uploading images or files or whatever, it never takes. It's never taken me more than maybe two days. <clears throat> so if you're actually approving a game page that that could easily take longer i don't know uh like i said i popped in there <clears throat> maybe once or twice and never hung around i haven't really um ah, okay so there we there we go um but oh, I got to take some Sudafed here tonight. As soon as soon as we're done here, I'm taking the Sudafed. Um, <clears throat> uh, Perfidious Albion mentions that Game Squad is one of the oldest forums for ASL. Um, most that's interesting actually because most of our publishers do not have their own forums. Uh, if anybody has examples of war game publishers that do have their own forums. Throw it in the chat. Mostly they don't. Um, <clears throat> this is opposed to RPG publishers. Uh, and I'm just, again, this is just off the top of my head. I don't know if Wizards has a forum or not. I would assume that they do. Um, but Steve Jackson Games has a forum that's been around literally forever. Um, Mongoose has their own forum. I think it's typical for an RPG publisher to have their own forum. And that's not at all typical for Wargame publishers. 10K Games does. There you go. Uh, but John's already, um, you know, uh, John's well ahead of of the of the development curve of their game in a number of respects, and this is one of them. So, lock and load might. I don't know about critical hit, and I don't want to know. Lock and load. Uh, okay, if they have their own forums, that's that's unusual though. Um, that's interesting though because. Until I know they've had some issues, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't know enough of the details, nor remember enough of the details to go into any of the details. But I know that Lock and Load has had some issues lately. Um, but I have, I have <clears throat> often felt and said at least a few times that I feel like Lock and Load kind of gets it in terms of like community management and stuff like that in it in a way that most war game publishers do not. Um, and it's it's one of the reasons and I've said this before too, uh, that I, I wish Lock and Load would do more games that I was interested in. Uh, that the like the second thing that they're doing that I was really super interested in. Lock and Load tactical is pretty good. Don't get me wrong, um, but at Glory and Empire, as Iggy Cryptal mentions, Glory and Empire is very promising looking, and when it's closer, we'll see some content on it. <coughs> so, which I, <laughs> at this point, it's about a year late. Maybe a year and a half. Um, and so at this point, I kind of hope it doesn't come out until after Origins. Let me put it that way. 
Yes. Um, I I knew this and then forgot it and then and then was advised again, I think, by Brandt um, uh, that this was the case. David was David Heath was running Matrix games at one point. Um, I am not positive that the trial of strength situation is lock and loads fault, however. So. No, 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 no. I mean, Lock and Load has a long history of delivering product. They, they're having some issues right now, and I'm hoping that they can work through those issues. But time will tell. Uh, and as Brandt points out, the Dietz Foundation has their forums on Brandt, on the Armchair Dragoon site. That doesn't count, though. Um, that that doesn't, that, that, that absolves the publisher, and good for Jim Dietz, right? Um, of having to deal with the res- with the responsibilities and the headache and the expenses of running the site, right? Uh, maybe they do their own moderation, um, and that's fine, but they don't have to deal with a whole bunch of the technical uh, stuff uh, that otherwise they would have to. All right. So Vincenzo says that David Heath was one of the founders of Matrix and went out when Slytherin bought it. So when Matrix Games got, I'm going to look something up here. When did Matrix Games get started? Because I, I have a, I have a bottom date for that. God damn it! I pulled up Matrix Games. Not uh, does it? There we go. All right. So Matrix Games founded in 1999. Interesting. Headquarters is in Dayton, Ohio. Uh. They also have a location in Surrey in the UK. Okay, so here's why this is interesting. Remember that game store, that local game store that I told you that I grew up near? Um, that was called Matrix Games, no connection. Um, when Matrix Games, these guys started that we're talking about, started their company, they learned a year or so later that there was already a, a, another thing called Matrix Games. Um, so they reached out to the lo- friendly local game store and worked out a friendly arrangement. Um, but when I hear Matrix Games to this day, that's what I think. Jack, if you're watching, that's your fault. So, um, All right. Oh, there we go. Uh, new scenarios for uh, literal, littoral, I'm going to pronounce it littoral commander Indo-Pacific. Let me put it that way. Yeah, Vicenza says that Matrix's PR office is actually here in Milan. It is very well run. And they eat well, too, I would imagine. My brother went to Florence last year sometime, and I'm very jealous about it, um, since I've never been to Europe. I'm going to ask another question here. We're, we're, we've been a little light tonight. Maybe it's, maybe it's the topic. I don't know. And I'm not at my most energetic. Like I said, I've, I've still got a cold. I'm still taking Sudafed. I realized that I had a cold, I think on Thursday, by the way. Um, and it's not, it's not, I'm not like super duper sick, but, I'm, you know, it has an energy level impact and I'm certainly snottier than I ought to be. Um, would folks be, let me, let me con- conduct an impromptu poll in the chat. If I were to do a live show that would be something like this show, but on a non-wargaming topic, every once in a while, we're talking about no more than once a month and probably less than that. Would you rather see it just be on Monday night or be its own thing on a different night? Let me put it that way. And I'm talking if I want to do a show about music or, or RPGs or, or whatever. So Wargame Design Studio are also the inheritors of the John Tiller um, legacy, if you will. John Tiller is another one who passed away. Uh, Brant, make sure we have John Tiller on the list if if uh, the dates are right. Um, <clears throat> I think Wargame Design Studio was around before then, and it looks like they are making some like really critically needed UI improvements slowly to the John Tiller stuff. So I have a I have um, an interest in keeping an eye on that. Let me put it that way. Best prog albums ever. I could do this. I could totally do this. I'd be probably pretty conventional about it, but maybe maybe folks would still find pr- conventional prog list to be pretty novel nowadays, considering that some of the artists are pretty obscure. To be fair. 
All right, game playthroughs, demos are so helpful. I would, too. I'd love to have time to do this. Uh, let me put it this way. Yeah, I think you're right. Twitter feed is light. Twitter feed is really light, actually. Um, okay, so we'll do it. Uh, we'll do it as a separate thing if we decide to do that. I, I c currently do not have the time to do something like that anyway. So, but uh, it does appear to be. Oh yeah, but I'm not doing. I'm not doing any this anything like once a week. I'm thinking like quarterly is more like it. Um, so I can handle it once, right? Oh, that's interesting. They have a game of the week on sale every Monday. So uh, I'm I buy stuff directly from Matrix. I prefer it when Matrix sells their stuff through Steam because that way I don't need to worry about a launcher or anything like that. So um, I will typically buy uh, a Matrix games through Steam or Slytherin uh, through Steam when available. I have occasionally broken that rule. I think the only time I broke that. No, twice. I broke that rule twice. Uh, Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, which at least at the time was not available on Steam. And the... Uh, what was the other one? Uh, the World in Flames uh, Computer Edition, which I started up and kind of noodled with for 20 minutes or so, which if you've ever even opened the box of World in Flames, you'll know that this is not gameplay, okay? That's me just kind of going and looking at the list of scenarios and the graphic settings and stuff like that. Um, uh, I, uh, Michael, I appreciate it. I am already on the hook for, for a John Tiller game that I never wrote, br uh, Brant a review for. That was, uh, piss, Shelt 44, which looks awesome. Uh, but then I, I started it up and was totally baffled by the interface. And I'm like, man, I, I can't, I can't sink 80 hours into this just to learn the interface. So... There you go. There you go. But, uh, Michael, this is a much appreciated. I do appreciate it. Um, I turn down a lot more free. I get. I don't know if anybody, I don't know what people think, how much free product we YouTubers get, but generally that number is actually really small. Maybe uh, maybe the player's aid does better than I do. That's very plausible, but but I get very little free product. Let me put it that way. Um, Decision sends me stuff from time to time. Um Columbia sends me stuff from time to time. And unless I ask, that's basically, I'm, I'm probably forgetting something, but unless I ask, that's basically it. Sometimes I'll get like a, a PDF of uh, War Diary or something like that. So, you know, Mike, I, I think good for you that I think you're probably asking, right? And I gen I almost never ask. This is a, a, a very interesting topic is the, Sh the Schelt or Skelt campaign, if you're Dutch. Um, this is actually a super interesting topic, and I'd like to see it explored in more war games, but it hasn't really been much, not much has been done with it. All right. Uh, yes, absolutely. Patrick, welcome back to the show. Good to have, always good to have you here. Uh, I agree with this. I, I mean, it was cheap when I bought it. It was on deep discount. I might I might have paid ten bucks for it, but I agree with this statement. It is functionally still in beta. Um, John Longshore sent me the maps, the the printed maps that they did, where the entire planet is at the European scale, and I can considered uh, plastering them to the wall of the, of the war room as a mural. But then I realized I needed to do other stuff with the walls, so that did not work out. But I do have them. <clears throat> Uh, I have no compunctions about uh, Marco hedging his statements on if he thinks the game sucks or not. Um, and furthermore, I will go so far as to say that Marco is one of the complaints. Maybe complaints is too strong a word, but maybe it's not. Um, I, one of the things that people say about us, war game people on YouTube, um, is that we're not negative enough, right? And what they mean is that uh, they don't they don't see review, negative reviews of games. Um, and I that's true. That, that that is an accurate description of what we actually see. We don't see many negative reviews of war games. But part of the reason for that is that it's a, 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 even a relatively 
only the very simplest war and more most accessible war games are really easy enough to like okay we're going to go in we're going to play this four times and then we'll be prepared to write a review of it okay most war games are not like that most war games are are, are a, a more serious time investment than that so if i'm going to invest 30 hours into playing a game and then so I'm prepared to write a review of it and if I didn't then I'm not prepared to write a review of it and I'm not going to um then if the game sucks I'm not going to invest that 30 hours right I, I'm just not going to do that so now on the other hand that's why I don't do reviews I'm almost never so so on the one hand uh, there you go. Brand has uh, review copies of a variety of things. Reach out to him if necessary. Go to armchairdragoons.com. Um, uh, Col- Columbia really gets it nowadays, too. I, I will say that. Uh, often this is the case, right? But think about this, though. Just, just think about the kinds of games we play. Um, if I'm going to play a game, okay, I'm going to spend a whole week playing On to Richmond 2, and I probably, go coming out of that, am, am as prepared as anybody to do a review of On to Richmond 2, but then I don't have time to actually write the friggin' material. So, I don't know. If I was a small publisher, I'd, if I was a small publisher, I'd probably send it to Marco before it got published and, and to get his feedback. That's the thing that that does happen every night. <laughs> Vincenzo says that Marco sleeps two hours. Oof. Boy, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I can't do that. Callendale doesn't pull any punches either. Um, however, what you'll find, though, is in, when Enrico does a review, yes, he's he'll have a video at the end that's called The Review. But to really understand where he's coming from, you probably ought to have watched the accompanying video playthrough, too. And what you often end up with is 5 or 10 or sometimes 50 hours of review that you really ought to watch. And not everybody can even do that, right? I I have a a super duper high opinion of of Tom and Grant and and, and everybody at Columbia uh, Games. I have been a fan of theirs for since the very late 80s or maybe very early 90s. Let me put it that way. So a lot of game stores wouldn't deal with them um, because it's it's too niche. Which is unfortunate because they're 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 there's their stuff's good too. I mean, maybe you're you're not into block games or RPGs or whatever, uh, but if you are, then you should be seriously looking at their stuff. And branches are already that you are. Let me put it that way. We're gonna have some more Harn content coming, folks. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that um, it's unlikely at this point that you're gonna see a Traveler Tuesday this week. However, uh, and that's because not enough stuff got done over the weekend. Um, However, the the chances of you you're, you're going to see a a Traveler Tuesday video sometime in the next couple of weeks. Let me put it that way. And maybe I'll pl- plan that stuff um, so that it's happening during uh, Buckeye Game Fest. Vincenzo loves Steve Dolge's channel. I also love Steve Dolge's channel. Uh, I also feel like uh, Steve and I are like long lost cousins or something because we have very similar tastes in games. Uh, I think if you put um, me and Steve Dolges and Doug from the Tabletop's Edge all in the same room, we would get along splendidly. Um, unfortunately, uh, Steve is out in like Seattle or or Oregon or someplace like that. So see Stigler, he's out by you. Um, where Doug's in Kentucky, so he's not close. But I, you know, I, I'll, I'll you know, be hanging out with Doug again at Buckeye Game Fest. So. Uh, I think the players aid are. I, I love the players aid. They're great guys. If you've met them, they're great guys. Um, they do really good content. Um, they do a lot of content. They have a particular style of th- ways that they approach what they do, and and that's different from everybody else, and that's completely normal and natural. So I, I have nothing but positive vibes for uh, Grant and Alexander. Little less for Alexander's wardrobe, but I think Ale- I think we gave Alexander a complex by making fun of his wardrobe choices all, all that time. Um, 
Best written world. <clears throat> I'm going to differ with you on this, John Madison, but I think maybe you mean something different than I, I mean. I think the best written world... I'm going to get pushed back for this. I think the best written game world I have ever seen is probably Exalted. Um, the game system is very dodgy, and the like lookup utility of the books, I'm talking about the an older edition, of course, um, is, is bad. Um, there's a lot of negative things to say about that, but it is a wonderfully written setting. Um, Harn can come off I never found it dry, but I got a friggin' history degree. Why would I think it was dry? Um, <clears throat> so lots of folks uh, might find it dry. I don't think so. And I've tried to highlight how it's not whenever I do a video on that. So there you go. Just a guard who's also up there uh, says that Steve is outside Seattle as opposed to inside Seattle. Uh, it is very easy to read it this way. You know, um, I sympathize with this because there's there's lots of really high quality channels that 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 do a fabulous job of covering shit I don't care about. Okay, I'm not even talking about wargaming here necessarily. Um, but the you know if if they're not covering your stuff, this is why I don't buy lock and load stuff because like everything, not everything, but the vast majority of stuff that they do is like modern ta World War Two and forward tactical and i just that's a really crowded space and i don't need anything else in that space now as soon as they said hey we're redoing trial of strength i owned the original panther games trial of strength and i was like oh okay I'm, I'm for that and then nobody knows what's going on with that but it probably ain't coming out and then when they uh glory and empire they started talking about that now we're talking about tactical napoleonics that's different i'm very interested in that so Vincenzo Beretta, personal vote goes to Planescape. That is actually a, a, a very neat setting, too, and one that the D&D &D rules are not particularly good at exploring. Let me put it that way. Um, the um, But it's a neat setting. My favorite D&D &D setting that like TSR did was uh, Birthright. Um, for the record, uh, thoroughly considered, the only the only other example is Tecamal. <clears throat> I mean, there's there's it, it's not close, except maybe Tecamal. And and in that case, you know, it was the unique work of a single individual who turned out to be kind of a fucked up individual. You know what I'm saying? Rokugan's pretty neat. Uh, Lock and Load Tactical, oh, that's a good, good catch here. Lock and Load Tactical Digital, which you can get on Steam, is a cheaper way to checking out the system. Nations at War Digital, too. I'd be more interested in checking out Nations at War because I haven't played that. I have played Lock and Load Tactical. And I like Lock and Load Tactical. I think it's a pretty solid system. It, and if I wasn't already, I mean, there's a new ASL product. Ah, shit. I got to pull that up. Um, there's a brand new pre order up today. For anybody interested in ASL, this is ASL Action Pack number 19, Roads to Rangoon, British versus Japanese. It's on, uh, it's got three maps and 10 scenarios, and they're the AB double sided uh, maps. Um, I thought about this because I don't have quite as much in the Southeast Asia stuff, and it's, it's Southeast Asia, right? So, um, I don't have a, that much in this particular space, and it's 33 bucks or something like that. Yeah, 33 bucks pre-order. So I thought about ordering this, even though I said I wasn't going to order any more ASL stuff. Um, however, I, I'm not afraid to buy it later either. So um, if it comes to that, I can always order it later. It's not that much more expensive. Um, and at least before it goes out of print, then it becomes very expensive. Um. All right, so yeah, and, and uh, they've given reasons very similar to what I laid out. It's like, yeah, well, I, we could do a review on this game that we hated, but then we'd have to spend 30 hours playing this game that we hated, and then we'd have to do a video on it, right? And nobody wants to do that. So, uh, yeah, that's a thing that just came out in the last year or two that uh, Mr. Barker was, in fact, a neo-Nazi. So... Um, that kind of spoiled the whole thing. 
Um, I guess I, I haven't sold off any of my Tecumel stuff. I have a lot of Tecumel stuff. I've got the I, I showed off Empire of the Petal Throne a few weeks ago. Um, I've got. Nope, that's not it. All right. So. <sighs> Zatola Publishing did these two books on the gods of Tecumel. Mitlanyal, volumes one and two. These go for a lot of money. This is one of a small number of proof copies that were produced. Signed by the authors. So God only knows what this is worth. This might be the most valuable single thing in my collection, possibly including Campaign for North Africa. So, yeah, I've got a lot of Tecumel stuff. Um, and I was I was very closely... I mean, it's not like there was a ton, that much material in terms of actual volume, but um, I've got... And remember, Clash of Arms was publishing it at one point. Uh, remember... Uh, Midland Y'all is expensive. The 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 Tristat Tecumel game that uh that um Guardians of Order did before they decided to be crooks um in a totally unrelated story. Um that goes for a lot of money. The original Empire of the Petal Throne goes for a lot of money. I could I got War of Wizards for Christ's sake. I could probably turn this whole thing over for two grand. Um but I I I have not re reached that point yet. I've got all the army books they did with the miniatures games. I don't even play miniatures. I've got a few of the miniatures actually. Um, I've got the Book of Ebon Bindings, which is like an in-universe book on demonology. It's something else. So, and these are really good books. I mean, I don't necessarily think. I mean, Tecumel inspires Harn, and then Harn inspires Tecumel back into getting you books like this. Um, and these are really nice books too, but they're they're worth a bunch of money. So, yeah, it's this is true. But remember that uh, they've got um, they've got uh, a new edition of Doomed Battalions. Is it Doomed Battalions um, coming as well? And I have signed up for that because that's the last. Um, that's the yeah that's this that's the last core module i need uh in an updated edition i i've run um i've run tecumel using the tristat rules and i actually ran tecumel using dragon quest spi and eric goldberg's dragon quest um but i you know it's a lot harn is way easier to approach than tecumel is so yeah, but I don't need this. I, I bought this last time. Um, so I am completely fine with that. Oh, that's interesting. Also played Tecmo using Dragon Quest. It's 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 like Dragon Quest is like it's it's just weird enough to work, you know? So we're gonna put uh, these out of here so I don't set a drink on them or something stupid like that. And they're in pretty good shape. Another thing I bought was that limited edition D and D slipcase set um, for the fifth edition books, and that's apparently going for several hundred dollars now. Uh, I'd have to check this. There's uh, so there are three editions of Dragon Quest, and then at least one, and maybe two or three other games called Dragon Quest that are not Dragon Quest. When I say Dragon Quest, I am referring to SPI's Dragon Quest. Uh, unless we're counting Commando, and I think we should, I now have all of SPI's RPGs. And this thing, um, there is a counter sheet in here. It's uh, like a half a counter sheet. Um, so this is punched. Oh, and we got the randomizer chits, too, for the the prison chits, as we called them. I don't know that that's really what they were. Um, but then we've got a character generation and combat book and a magic book. The magic book, the magic rules in here are really quite neat. Um, and then skills, monsters, and adventures. 
Um, of the the three, maybe four or four and a half, perhaps RPGs that SPI did, I think it is not particularly close that Dragon Quest is the best one. Um, this is the first edition. So there were there were three editions: the first two under SPI, and then a third edition which was a perfect bound paperback under TSR. Because remember, TSR ended up with the property. So. Um, as you'd expect from TSR of the era of the 80s, they took out all the demons and stuff. And there's some really interesting demonology in here, by the way. And it's not necessarily even interesting in a good way, but it's it's interesting. Um, it's also, I also find it pretty interesting that, do I have? No, I don't have. Um, Avalon Hill did... Four RPGs. So they did Rune Quest, which was under license with from Chaosium. They did Powers and Perils, which which is right here, um, which I actually also have fondness for, but bluntly, it is not as strong a game as Dragon Quest. Um, and I did pre-order Thunder on the Mississippi. I'll assume this to have been a rhetorical question. Um. Um, I have, I have complex opinions on the world of Greyhawk. It's not my favorite setting, but it's certainly not my least favorite setting either. Um, this is another one, by the way, that I never got rid of. This is my original copy. I did get rid of the supplements for it, which was dumb because just a few years ago, I had to, I had to, I, I spent many years looking to reacquire, let me pull this off. To reacquire one of the supplements for Powers and Perils. Perilous Lands. This is the world for Powers and Perils. And it's kind of neat, actually. This was about $100, and it is still in the shrink wrap. Um, and $100 is a very good price for it in the shrink wrap. So, anyway. Uh, they also did... Um, Poop. They did Lords of Creation, which was Tom Moldvay's game, and they did what was it called? Damn it! They did uh, another one later on that was like uh, I forget. Well, certainly, um, Rune Quest is not super duper table heavy, uh, but Powers and Perils is very table heavy. So, so there's that. Um. Vicky, I don't know offhand, but just go to GMT's website at, and scroll down to the bottom and see the update, and the, the dates for it will be in that update. So, I'm not walking out of the room, though. I'm just, Dan, where Dan is a tendency to just wander off. I may reach over to the shelf to grab something. So, as Weekend at the Warehouse is not something I intend to be able to go to anytime soon. Uh, I was not, it, uh, the dates are not on my radar. And I just looked up today, the dates for uh, WBC, and I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I just don't think the money is going to be there. So, like I said, we'll day, we'll, we'll day trip it out. But uh, at, at least, uh, I'd kind of like to stay overnight at least, but we'll, not there. Fuck that. That's, that place is too expensive. Um, but are you talking my camera angle? I haven't changed the camera angle in the last few weeks i will periodically adjust it though it's probably i have taller hair today that's probably what it is so and i am absolutely roasting in this room at this point this is the problem if i leave this door closed it, it does get a little hot in here so normally i don't leave that door closed so all right folks i think we're going to wrap things up here i'm going to try and get some video out later this week um that may that that is almost certain to include an unboxing video for Thursday, but it probably won't include anything else at this point. But Dan and I will be on tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then I may throw some shorts out, too. I've got a pile of shorts that I need to curate and, and go uh, figure that out. Rogue77 asks, how much is one look one looking at for a typical convention? Are we talking about the expense of going? 
Um, typically, the biggest expense is the hotel, right? Um, so that's what you got to be concerned about. But that also means that if you have a, lo- a place that's local enough that you could commute there, you don't have to pay that. Maybe you have to pay parking instead. That's possible. Um, my budget for Buckeye Game Fest is twelve hundred dollars, um, and that is because it is a it's five nights in a hotel. Um, and it's a relatively expensive hotel. There is a room, re- you know, a, bo- a room block for the event, but it's still expensive. Um, and you got to eat there too. Now, the nice thing about uh, BGF is based on where it is, it's the Hyatt, the same Hyatt that Origins is attached to. Um, you just walk down the hall to get food. And if you're, if you want to be cheap about it, you can just get Subway. Um, so that's a thing, but there's also nothing open late there either, unless you want to go across the street to uh, one of the bars or, which is a, a bit of a hike, um, or you don't mind eating pizza because there's a pizza place that's open pretty late. But I'll tell you what, it's Jet's Pizza, which I love Jet's Pizza, and I'll get it once because if I do it two days in a row, the third day will be a bad day, if you know what I'm saying. So. Uh, I mean, I, I think this is a great thought, but but the fact is that the hotel e- eats most of the cost. Now, there's there's all kinds of ways to mitigate that, too. Can you split the room with somebody? Boom, your hotel costs are cut in half. Are you willing to stack people like cordwood in the room and put six people in your room? Then your your hotel costs are, are split six ways, right? Um, so there's ways to mitigate those those costs, but the, the, the biggest single expense is typically the hotel. Um, and if you have to fly, then potentially airfare is also potentially expensive. John, thanks for stopping by. So uh, you do have to get, I we I have just worked out as of this past, this was another thing on my friggin' clipboard this week, was to get um, the, the Origins Hotel thing sorted out. And the hotel will cost $400 a night, Okay. Fortunately, I am splitting that with somebody. I am not splitting the hotel for BGF. And that's just because I don't have anybody. So, um, so oh, well. Uh, yeah, two days of Jets, you probably want to stay out of the room. This is why I don't have a roommate, folks. Yeah, I've been eating Jets all week. It's good pizza, but, uh, man, it's, it's bad on the digestion, if you know what I'm saying. You could show up in a mini RV. Parking is expensive down there, I will tell you that. Rental cards. Um I, this is the, so BGF will be the second convention that I've rented a car to go to. The first was Winterfest a month and a half ago. Yes. Yes. The problem is that the the room blocks for the convention sell out immediately, right? But that's not the whole hotel. That's just the blocks. Um, so yeah, they'll, the, you, if you, the $170 a night rooms are sold out, they'll be happy to send you a $400 a night room. So um, but in any case, all right, folks, we're going to wrap this up here tonight. So stay tuned tomorrow. We'll have a show with Dan and then stay tuned on Thursday. We'll have an unboxing video of some kind. Um, and we do have some exciting things in the pipeline ahead, but I've been a bit busy with other stuff for the last few weeks. If you know what I'm saying, if you haven't voted in the CSRs yet, please go vote. The, uh, ballot is at right here. For the 2023 Charles S. Roberts Award. So go ahead and do that. Um, And we will see everybody next week. Don't forget to uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. And do all the things in the video description to support the channel and all that jazz. Everybody have a great night. And we'll see you all again soon. (laughs) 